Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. Today we are going to be talking about a case that I'm sure most of you haven't heard of. The reason I say that is because I couldn't even find a picture of this man. We're going to be talking about a hiker who walked into the Grand Canyon and was never seen alive again. Jeffrey Ridnour was 63 years old at the time of his disappearance. This takes us all the way back to 1978. Jeffrey was living in Southern California. He was an experienced hiker. However, he was just tired of the smog. He liked to get out now and again. So he planned this trip to go out to the Grand Canyon. Jeffrey was 5'8". He was only 130 pounds, but apparently in very good shape for his age. He was 63 years old. He had reddish hair with a pencil thin mustache. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Grand Canyon is in Arizona, sort of in the central northern part of the state. He had planned to go to the south rim of the trail. He had only hiked the Grand Canyon one other time. Now, this is a picture of sort of where he started his hike. I'm going to go over some of these things just so you can get an idea and a feel for it. This is the south rim of the Grand Canyon, which is where he started his hike. When he started this hike, he brought his vehicle, which was a station wagon, and his bicycle. Jeffrey left his car at the end of the road on the south rim where the Tanner Trail begins and then it goes into the depths of the Grand Canyon where he left his bicycle on the other end where the New Hans Trail starts. Now there are three different routes possible between the Hans and Tanner Trails that follows the Colorado River part of the way and then goes into cliffs and ledges at other points. So. Again, we're not sure which trail he took, but he did leave this note on his bicycle saying, Hiking the canyon will be out by May 28th. Donald Chase, who was the service unit manager at the time, is quoted in saying, It's almost as though he was swallowed up physically by the vast expanse of rock, sand, and silence that defies life and death in this eighth wonder of the world. We do know that Jeffrey had gotten a backcountry permit, and it is noteworthy that on that permit it said not recommended because the ranger who had issued him the permit cited that he had only hiked the canyon twice. The temperatures had been getting up over 115 degrees, despite the fact that there had been a heavy snowfall the winter prior, thus giving more water sources, the ranger was still concerned about the 63-year-old man. However, Jeffrey insisted that he was in great shape, which the ranger could tell. He could tell that Jeffrey was very articulate, so that he went ahead and there was really nothing he could say. He couldn't say you couldn't have the permit. He qualified, so he got the permit. Now, it's unclear, like, what happened, where Jeffrey maybe went amiss. We do know that this was sort of a delayed search because it wasn't actually until Jeffrey didn't return his permit. I don't know what the rules are in the Grand Canyon today, but at the time, the permits had to be returned. On May 28th, he had not returned his permit. This is when David Chase sent a ranger out to look for his vehicle. Now, the vehicle that Jeffrey had driven was a Dodge Dart station wagon. It was a brownish in color. When the ranger went to where the wagon was supposed to be parked, he didn't see it. However, the odd thing was, two days later, another ranger went to that same lot and the Dodge Dart was there. This led the rangers to believe that Jeffrey was still out in the park. He had come back to his car to resupply and then went back out again. That was on a Sunday. The next Tuesday, which was May 30th, rangers noticed that the car possibly could have been moved and it was kind of parked in a different direction. This is when they ran the license plate number and they verified that it was Jeffrey Renauer's car. This is when a full-scale operation began on June 4th. The rangers verified that the last confirmed sighting of Jeffrey was at the South Rim Backpacker Rental Store where he had been rented a poncho. Unfortunately, they continued to interview hikers and not one hiker could confirm that they saw Jeffrey on the trails. According to the Park Service, this quickly escalated into the most extensive and one of the most intensive searches that the Grand Canyon had up until that point. They had over 50 ground searchers. They had people rappelling, trying to search under ledges because they said that a lot of times people fall, their remains will be obscured. They're often not found until years later. But even with this, they had no leads, no clues, until one day, one of the searchers came up. They went to one of Jeffrey's campgrounds that they thought he had stayed at. It was near his car. They found a pair of glasses and a razor that was placed on a rock. They made it clear that they could tell this had not fallen out of someone's backpack. It had been placed there. 
was right next to his one of his old campsites. However, after thorough investigation, they couldn't even determine whether it was his razor or his glasses. Unfortunately, after three weeks of ground searches, helicopters, scouring over a hundred square miles of the canyon country, which in reality is not that much when you think of how big the Grand Canyon is, but they had to start scaling down the search because they just didn't have any leads. By this point too, they had to come to the realization and acknowledge the fact that unless he had gotten out of the canyon and was with other people, there was a good chance that he was most likely deceased because they knew that his permit only was for a couple of days, so they assumed that he probably didn't have enough supplies but for that, and now it had been over three weeks. However, David Chase did an amazing job. He kept sending at least two rangers out every day. They did have a helicopter fly over, I think once a week for another week or two. They also had a U.S. Park Ranger fixed-wing aircraft do flyovers for the next couple of weeks. However, unfortunately, even with all these extended efforts, they still came up empty-handed. Some of these rangers had been working at the canyon for over a decade and they said that this particular case really troubled them. Because not only was it one of their biggest intensive searches, but Jeffrey was very experienced. He had a very well planned out route. He had his car, he had his bike. They just couldn't help but wonder what could have possibly had happened to him. Now granted the Grand Canyon is massive, it could only take one slip and fall. So they figured that he probably fell into the Colorado River, and based on what the rangers said, for one, scuba diving or scuba searching in the Colorado River is pretty much pointless because of the rapids, the various depths, the curves, so they don't usually do that. They said, unfortunately, if that is the case, they will search a little bit in boats, but unfortunately, after that amount of time, this point had been almost a month, they just usually have to wait for the remains to come up, which does sound horrible, but he said that, in this case, they waited. They thought that for sure they'd find something. He said that just the week prior, when they were down on the Colorado River, they found some remains, but it had been so long, they had no idea who they belonged to. Now, this was obviously prior to Jeffrey going missing. He was just making a point. At the time when Jeffrey went missing, the park rangers, they wanted to come up with an idea of how they could possibly track the footprints because during this search they did find various footprints, however they had no idea what kind of shoes or boots Jeffrey was wearing. So one of the ideas that David Chase came up with was to photocopy the hiker's shoes as they came in so that way if they had gone missing they could match them up later, however after thinking about it he felt like that would be impractical. Jeffrey was never found, and no other clues were ever found, which the park ranger said was very strange. Now, sometimes when a person goes missing, they don't find anything, but usually they find something. Granted, they did find glasses and a razor. However, they couldn't even confirm, like I said, that those were belonged to Jeffrey. So it's just one of those mysteries where, how did this guy just disappear from the face of the earth? I know a lot of you will say, well, it's the Grand Canyon. You're right. It's huge. There's plenty of places to go missing or fall. I mean, it's just who knows what could have happened to him. What I found was that I just couldn't believe that what the Rangers and the reports and the articles said that this was one of the biggest searches up until that point, yet I couldn't even find a picture of this guy. The only information I could find on this case was diving deep into the archives, deep into old newspapers. I pulled everything that I could, but when I ran his name on Google or any of those searches, nothing, nothing came up. It's like the case never happened, but I have documented proof that it did happen. It's just unbelievable, and of course his family never got closure. This year will mark the 45th anniversary of his disappearance. I personally have never been to the Grand Canyon, however, if I ever do go out, I'm definitely gonna go to that trailhead and leave one of the silver angels that I got that I leave for all the, the missing people that we never find. It's just like Jeffrey vanished into thin air and no one ever saw or heard from him again. The director at the time is quoted in saying, now only a pair of glasses and a razor physically testify to Jeffrey's presence in the canyon. The rest is missing where nature has dug a huge, unfeeling hole punctuated only by the fury of a river's white water. We'll probably never know what happened to Jeffrey. We do know that he absolutely loved the Grand Canyon. And if that is where he passed away, at least we know that his final resting place is one that he always loved. Hopefully over distance and time, the years have given his family and friends peace and have left them with only the cherished memory of Jeffrey, his love of adventure, his love of the outdoors, and his love of life. 
Thank you all for watching. As always, wishing you all a happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music. I will see you all in the next one. Take care. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me till the end. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, education, and more. No copyright infringement is intended. The clips used in this video are brief, edited, usually with me narrating over, showing only amounts needed to make my point. I do not own or claim to own the rights to the footage. This video is considered fair use by YouTube and federal copyright law. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. In the coming weeks, I'm going to be doing more of these videos where I dive deep into the newspaper articles, whatever articles I can find, and cover cases that have just gone uncovered and a lot of people don't even know about. Because like I said in another video, every case is important, and I think that it's important that we talk about them. This case, I just really, like I said, it struck me because of the massive search that they did. And yet I couldn't even find a picture on Google. And obviously he was never found. It's like the Grand Canyon just swallowed him up. I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.